Okay, let's start the second talk. Uh, before I start the talk, uh, this year we have our award, best talk award. So check out your site and you check in the uh, setting of a uh, level. So the second speaker is Harrison came from Singapore. So he talked about uh, uh, using machine learning to try and predict the taxi availability. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Hari, I'm here from Singapore and uh, I'm going to speak about machine learning. So I started uh, learning machine learning sometime about the end of last year. Uh, so I've been working in a bank, uh, I've been with a bank for about seven years, before that I was in a lot of uh, messaging applications. So I've worked with a bunch of applications and whenever I try to learn something new, something I need to pick up. I, I try to do it in Python. I, uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah? Okay, sure. So whenever I need to learn something new, I use uh, uh, Python because it's very easy to learn. And um, beginning of this year, I started working in, in big data and I wanted to learn how to do machine learning. So I picked an example which is uh, close to my my place where I live, Singapore, and in this conference we'll see how I learned uh, uh, implementing this in a very simple way, and hopefully you'll be able to learn from that. So what we will be doing here is we will learn what kind of algorithms you can use and how you can predict availability of caps. We'll see some code samples, and I'm assuming that everybody has some experience working with some of these libraries in the past. What we will not be doing is we'll not go into the mathematics of all these algorithms, because even I'm still learning some of them, and if I try to go into that, we won't finish in this half an hour. Uh, we will not go into neural networks or anything complicated, and I'm not going to run anything on a cloud or anything, uh, because I try to keep the examples as simple as possible. You could run on your PC, and maybe one day you can build something run on the cloud. Right? Let's get started. So, what is machine learning? If you look at Wikipedia, uh, machine learning was a phrase which was invented by a person called Arthur Samuel when he was working in IBM. And uh, simply put, machine learning means a computer will learn on its own by looking at raw data without being explicitly programmed what to do. So, you show it some information looks at it, figures out what to do, and then it performs something in the end. So a machine learns. Yeah, hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, This mic sounds much better. So you provide some information into a computer, and it learns from there. So. It's already part of our life. We already have systems where things learn. So, so how is it part of our life? This was supposed to be live by now. It's not there. So we don't have something such bad. But we have things where we have spam detection in email. That's machine learning. A computer algorithm looks at your email, figures out what mails you are reading, what mails you are not reading, and provides you spam. We see. We see ads when we go to e-commerce website. We experience search pricing in, when you use something like Uber. When you use a card outside your normal country, you get uh, emails about fraud or maybe uh, potential fraud. Your bank asks you, you, your card was used somewhere in Africa or somewhere else. Are you there? So we can build such experiences based on machine learning. So what we're trying to do there sounds very complicated, but if you want to learn something on your own, it's very easy. Machine learning, uh, if you want to start a very basic machine learning on your PC, you, you just need the right amount of raw data. Once you have it, you should be able to build something on your own. And if you're not trying to solve huge problems, you don't require a lot of complicated raw data either. So you have open APIs which uh, give you enough information to start up and then learn something and eventually build something big out of that, right? Python has a lot of libraries. Uh, I'll be using uh, scikit-learn because it's the most simple one I could find 
for my learning and it really made it very fast for me to pick up things. Uh, raw data, so you have a lot of open data APIs. You can use the Chicago bike sharing information. Um, and I think there's a cap availability of another city as well. Uh, but I would be using something from Singapore. Singapore government has a real-time API where you can get the current location of all the free cabs in the city at any given moment. So this um, is almost real-time. So you, it's updated once about half a minute. And it gives you a list of latitude and longitude for every cab in Singapore, which is free at the moment. So this is well documented. There's a free registration required and the usual uh, uh, use it with care. So it gives very uh, very good information. This is something which I plotted. I looked at for uh, 20 minutes. And the kind of uh, the kind of low level information which you have that you could almost plot the entire road network of Singapore. So very real time, very regularly updated. Um, preparing the data, just to point out before we get into the code, the API is there, real time, returns a, uh, a returns a list of all the all latitude and longitude, but that's not in a way which you can use. So I had to do a bit of uh, pre-processing. So I ran a script for about a week, collecting every five minutes, and then converted it into a grid and uh, stored that into SQLite. The raw information itself stored in files was about 500 MB. It loaded into SQLite at about 100 MB. So, all this is there in the code, which I'm going to show in one of the the following slides. It's available on my repository. Um, yeah, so this is the one. That is my GitHub repository. The first one has a has all the code, the script, which you can put into a cron job if you want to use. Even has a setup dot by. The second link is the Python notebooks, which you'll see now in this. Right. So let's see some code. So what do we do? So Singapore provides this information, which is very, uh, very easy to use. In, um, and this was actually, there was a, a session by one of the other uh, Python uh, users in Singapore who gave a very good analysis of this. Um, and it was captured over a period of time uh, of a week and, lo and loaded into SQLite. So once you have it, uh, this was put in a simple schema. So I am just capturing the grid. So I take the coordinates of Singapore and convert into a grid, which is about uh, 35 high, I mean, uh, 35 wide and about uh, 18 or 19 tall. Uh, and for each grid location at any given point of time, hour and minute, I am capturing how many caps are available. Um, this basic. With this information, very basic information, you can already plot some interesting things. Like if you see that, that is how many cabs are available across Singapore at maybe maybe 8 o'clock in the morning. And as you plot and you explore, you see that you can see the you can see a pattern of information there. So 8 o'clock, everything was concentrated in the suburbs around residential areas. And then you can see that everything moved into the central uh, city and the uh, area where we have most of the offices. So you can see patterns. Uh, you can expect what your machine will, uh, what your machine learning algorithm will predict based on these kind of things. So you can do some basic stuff like that. And once you do that, uh, in order to implement machine learning, you need to understand what sort of ranges the values are in. So taxi availability over a period of a day you would normally think that it varies. It will be high in residential areas in the morning. It will fall down as people go to offices, and it will increase in the office areas. So it will be like a polynomial. So if you try to plot of one of the locations, it looks like a polynomial. Yes. So, But you can't really figure out much from that. You don't know whether you have more high values or more low values. So let's try to see a histogram of that same thing. So this is the histogram of one of the uh, residential areas. And you can see that it has a lot of average values. 30, 40 is like an average value. And it occurs more number of times in that area. Very large numbers, very small numbers, very less. 
Uh, similarly, if you take something like this, a uh, second one, this is from an area in Singapore which is famous for restaurants and nightlife. Here also you'll have very large numbers, 120 plus, 140 plus caps any, at any point of time, but even that happens only on few occasions. So most of the time, you'll find it in a median range. So when you're trying to do machine learning, what, what I learned is if I try to predict exact value, it will not work. And if I include all these extreme values, I get very wrong predictions in the end. So I need to take what is the average value, and then I'll get an approximately correct prediction. So this is the first step which you learn. You have to ignore some part of it. You ignore anything below 0.1. You ignore everything which is more than 0.9. And then the values in between. You have to find this value based on whatever raw data you have. Uh, the extremes are not the most common values, so as long as you stick to the most common values, you will be able to get a very good prediction. A bit more stats, uh, but I'll probably not go into that now. Uh, so machine learning. So what do we do? So machine learning, as you know, is it, it can be either a supervised learning or it can be an unsupervised learning. So if I was trying to classify Singapore locations, the various parts of Singapore into high taxi availability or low taxi availability, then that would be a classification problem. But I'm trying to predict the values. So this is not classification, this is a regression. So it will be supervised learning. So I'm not going to go through this because it's just talk, talk, talk about uh, supervised learning and, and unsupervised learning. Let's see some concrete examples. So I said we'll be doing regression. Simplest possible regression is, uh, it's called a linear regression. So what we try to do in linear regression is, assuming you have a bunch of points on a graph, you try to draw a line which minimizes, which is equidistant from all points so that you have the minimum error. And then the next value should be somewhere along that line, up or below that. So doing linear regression in scikit-learn is very simple. You just have to implement, uh, you just have to extract your information into a list, uh, instantiate a linear regression model. You don't have to pass any additional parameters if you don't have any special thing. And then you fit it and you plot it. So the blue one here is the actual uh, availability from the API. The green one is what the model predicted. As you can see, linear regression is very bad at predicting because it does not follow all the variables properly. We just have four variables here, location, hour, minute, and whether it's a weekday or a weekend. Uh, but it's not following that. So this was bad. So what do we do? We need to, it has a very high error, and mean square error is very high. And, and basically, the score is very less. So what you can do is you can try a polynomial regression. So we already saw that tax availability is in a polynomial form. So I tried polynomial regression. Um, so when you do a polynomial regression, uh, you can choose whether you use a first degree polynomial or a second degree polynomial. So changing the various polynomial degrees, you see that if you do a first degree, it's, with, it's almost like doing a linear regression. Then you increase the degree of the polynomial, and with each increase, there is an improvement in the prediction matching with the actual value. This is a very good step. So improvement, and you can see the error. There are errors. It fails sometimes. It it misses the mark by almost 15 or 20, but it works much better than linear regression. This has a 69% score, which is very good. So can we improve on that? Yes, we can. So you have more complex polynomial regressions. Um, one of them is called the kernel ridge. So this, um, you can do RBF kernel or a polynomial kernel. I don't, I'm not familiar with the mathematics behind this completely, but I tried using a polynomial. Um, and again, tried to predict it. Um, I can provide an alpha, which indicates how much of my raw data I think is suspect. So change that. Um, and you can see it more or less gives the same result. But yeah, so kernel ridge is also very similar to polynomial. And I got the same kind of scores. I can see the same kind of matching, same kind of error where it's missing up to 15 sometimes. So no, I think there is a scope to improve this further. So what can we do? We can try another regression 
algorithm called random forest. So the first example which I talked was linear regression, which just tries to minimize the mean square error and draw a line which is equidistant from all the points. Polynomial also tries to do the same thing using polynomial regression, write an equation and fit it across everything. So random forest tries to do something else. What it tries to do is it uh, splits your information into uh, sets. For each set, it tries to build a separate estimator. This is called the ensemble estimator. So for the, your entire set of uh, training uh, information which you have, it will create multiple estimators. And your final prediction will be an average of that. So I'm trying to do random forest here on the same information, same location, and try to plot it. It looks very similar to polynomial. Uh, but the prediction errors are less. I have very few errors going all the way to 20. And if I look at the score, the score for the training data is 95%. So the random forest was able to fit 95% of the training data. Uh, prediction on the test data has about 60% score. Still an improvement, but not much. So what, what, what can we do? So we, you can change some of these parameters. You can do a warm start. So here, for example, one of the advantages of using random forest is you can do a warm start. So you give it a certain information. It learns from that. And then you increase the number of estimators, and you provide another set of training data. So then it fine tunes the first model into the second one. And then you can get better results. So you can try. Um, I had a fairly reasonable result here. So this prediction fits a lot closer to the actual one. And even the error is now less, around 5. So I don't see a lot of big spikes. The max is 15. Not bad. So you can do that. And you can still fine tune it, reduce it. And you can do. So as you see, from a simple linear regression, in a very few steps, I was able to come to this stage where the prediction is much better, feeling confident. So I want to compare this with my real world API. So ultimately, that's the aim. You build something which is as close to the real world behavior as possible. I don't have that many variables with me, but it should work. So I built a random forest, built the model, plotted it. I am happy with results. So what I've done here is uh, I have um, changed the location to another more popular market residential area. And this is much more closer. I have very less errors. So the, uh, the kind of error which you see also changes with the location which you have. And I'm trying to predict it. So I ran this before the talk. It predicted 11. Actual was only 12. So let's let's see uh, maybe it won't it will work now and we'll get another value actually 7 predicted is 12 still not very close there is a bit of error maybe if i increase the grid size so that i capture smaller set of locations then maybe that will give me better values so i use a larger grid i use a larger grid and i do the same thing and i'm trying to predict this time because i increase the grid size I already see an improvement in the error. Previously, it used to go till 7.5 and, and 8 off, plus or minus. Now it's less than 3. Encouraging. So let's try to predict this. This was pretty close before the talk. So what is it doing now? So now it predicted 2.8. It's impossible to have a, a, a fractional availability. But as you can see, it's pretty close to what it's trying to do. and. You have to fine tune this so I don't have the weather information in this, for example. Singapore also has a weather API. I could plug into that and see whether it's fair weather, rain, shower, uh, I don't know, all those kinds of things. And maybe I'll get a much better result. And ultimate aim, if you want to provide some information from this to the users, you have to build some sort of an application. So what I've tried to do here is, um, uh, not okay. Let me try to zoom out a little bit and see. Yeah, 
that looks much better. So this is just a map of Singapore, and I'm trying to predict the value at a location which I would know. So let me try to put it on the Changi Airport, which I know usually has pretty good accuracy in my model. So I've put it on the airport. It's running the model in the background. It's trying to predict. Um, let's give it a few seconds. So you would ultimately build something like this. And so yeah, it predicted there will be 27 caps. You found 32, actually. So it's very close. So as you fine tune your parameters, as you add more information, you can get more and more accuracy. And if you think about it, you could build something like this with zero knowledge up front. And as you build the model iteratively, learn. Python is very easy. And you can easily build, you can learn, you can keep fine tuning it. And maybe over a period of a week or a month, you will have a very good model. Then you can learn. I was able to build this in about four weeks. So even more time, more variables, you spend more, um, more hours working on that, you should be able to build something very easily. Right? So we got to that point, right? So what did I learn or what did we learn from this? You can start with some very basic machine learning very easily and predictions on very small uh, sets of raw data work very well. There is no one uh, a single algorithm which works for everything. I started with polynomial, which was almost working, but the prediction errors were, were very large. I moved on to random forest, which finally gave me a pretty close result. But even that, I had to increase the size of my grid in order to get a better result. So you have to fine tune it. And I would also need to add more information. Was it a holiday? Was the weather bad? Was there a storm? Was there haze? And only then I'll know, only then I'll have a more valid picture of the real world. Can we get 100% accuracy? No. Why not? So as we, we took a simple model and I tried to fit onto that, there's a chance that you do something which is called as overfitting. I write, I build a model, I put parameters so that it matches everything exactly. It follows one day perfectly. But then it will not work when I try to predict a value in the future because it's very rigid and it's not accounting for the natural variations. What are the natural variations? We are people. We don't know what we'll do. I might walk out of here and think I'll take the train from the station right next to the campus, but I might feel like walking. I walk all the way to Asida and take the other line from there. So that cannot be predicted into any model. So because of that, there will be some variations. And even if you have a good model, it will fail. We can reduce the error by putting artificial neural networks, all those things. But at the end of the day, if you build something like this, and for example, you put it on a mobile app, people know how many caps are there. The fact that you have a prediction changes people's behavior, which becomes another variable in the system. So it'll always keep feeding back. So you will never get 100% accuracy, and you'll always be roundabout there, and um, you have to keep on improving the system. And if you're working for a big company, you keep improving your platform. If you're just learning, you keep improving your techniques and you learn more so that you can use it in, a, in other places. And that's all I had. So any questions? Any question? Raise your hand to your question. Kim. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just got a question. Um, in the beginning, one of the slides, you mentioned that I don't have to be a data scientist yeah. um, to be at a such thing. And I'm far from it, <laughs> quite behind. I'm handicapped in the math. But I mean, uh, you mentioned about a few algorithms mm. that we're trying to explore what yeah. can best fit, right? Yeah. I mean, what, what's the best approach to pick the right algorithm? Or should I just try an error? Uh, so the best approach would, um, would be to iteratively uh, uh, try with something. So for example, based on the problem you pick, you would know whether it's just a simple linear varying variable like just a straight line or it just changes through the day. Taxi availability, for example, when I started with this, right at the upfront, I knew that it would not 
very predictably it would change through the day so i started with polynomial regression and then on that point from that point onwards based on the result which you're seeing you just keep fine tuning it so you run it once see how it goes fine tune the algorithm again and pick another one which is a variation of that so in this example polynomial would work almost you could improve that to a kernel rich which also works fine but the prediction errors are higher as you try to predict future then you have to do something like an ensemble which is like um it is like an averaging thing so then you go and because your behavior in the morning behavior during lunch time behavior in the evening will not be same you need more than one estimator so then you use something like random forest which will build an estimator for each part of your curve and then try to average it out so based on your problem you can do it some uh, cities have cab information where you have the beginning of a trip and the ending of a trip you you know the location so you're trying to find the path so when you're trying to find a path then maybe these will not work you need to do a classification you will not be able to do a regression you'll have to do a classification then this percentage goes to north this percentage goes to southwest or something like that so you uh, you have to keep evolving based on the score which you see and amount of error which you see in the prediction okay is that thinking process quite smart yeah that's that's a key part okay thank you was a question thanks for your talk thanks for your talk uh the situation in japan is a little bit different i think uh so you said taxi availability data sets are available from Singapore government? Yeah. Is there any regulation? Uh, no. So I think the Singapore government itself has a bunch of performance requirements for the cab companies. So the cab companies have to report this information and they only make a subset of it available. They only give us the free taxis available. The only regulation on that is I don't think I can use this for any commercial thing without uh, a proper approval uh, getting the information from the api as long as you call them once every minute they're okay with it oh, okay then, then how much is the cover rate of the all, all the taxi you know the cover rate uh this covers all the cab companies in singapore so we have what five companies all the five companies are included in this i think the cover rate is really uh depend uh, dep uh yeah effects on on the uh, accuracy yes yes yeah. so luckily singapore all the five companies are reporting so we have very good information there thanks um hello hello ah, okay uh so yeah right so a bit related question do you know if such data is available in japan japan no i was actually trying to see if i could at least show a plot of one of the cities in uh, Japan, but no, okay. I don't see any really. Maybe okay. you need to do a scraping somewhere and figure out if there is a third party site. All right. And then second question. So uh, you talked about some um, using some kernels. So I never really uh, got very deep into the whole kernel thing. So whenever I use the kernel method, I would just take a Gaussian kernel and then, uh, you know, uh, find the best um, parameter to fit. But you also use the polynomial kernel. Uh, blah, 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 kernel. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me why you use the polynomial kernel? Uh, so I just tried polynomial and there was one more called RBF. So what I found is when I tried the RBF, it was, um, I ran into the problem of overfitting. So the model it would build with RBF, it would, fail miserably when I try to predict uh, values into the future. So polynomial work best for me. But again, this is a trial and error. Uh, the entire kernel logic, even I'm not 100% confident about that, just need to keep learning on that. Even I need to explore that a bit more. OK, so it's not like uh, you know this kind of kernel fits to that kind of thing. We don't have a golden rule, anything like that. OK, that's mainly what I wanted to know. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Harley. What about question? Last question. You have a question? Okay, it's a last question. Oh yeah. 
just curious, if you were to take some a model like this that you've developed, uh, what kind of approach you would do to put it into production, or do you do that locally, or what? what? Uh, production. So um, one of the things you could do, um, my model, even if I serialize using pickle, is not very big. But one of the things which I read very recently from someone is, once you build a model, um, you can save the coefficients from the model into a simple YAML file or something, which will be very small. And on your production server, when it comes up, you can instantiate the model and reapply the coefficients on that. That way, you can reinitialize it. And I've heard of something called uh, Firefly. I'm not very sure about that name. I just recently heard it from someone, which which apparently is a way of uh, hosting the model as a function, function as a service, using AWS or one of those things. So, sure. 